Biobalance HealthCast, episode 171, Postmenopausal Uterine Bleeding. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Today we're going to talk about something that I run into every day of my practice and did even when I was just doing GYN, and that is postmenopausal uterine bleeding. That means you've got to be you've got to have already gone through menopause, and you have to have a uterus. So those of you who don't have a uterus may not want to listen unless you want to listen for your friends, but. Postmenopausal bleeding is such a huge deal because it's a trigger for doctors. Mm -hmm. Doctors go, "Ah, postmenopausal bleeding, Ah," because that is the only sign or the first sign of uterine cancer. So that's what they're thinking when they when they hear, "Oh, you're postmenopausal." It's like having a fire alarm go off. Right. So doctors immediately trigger to that, whether they be family practice, internal medicine, or, or GYN, and they and their job is to keep you alive. Our job is to keep you alive. So they think, I have to prove that this isn't cancer. So if they sound upset or, or, or like they are alarmed or anxious, it's because their job is to make sure you don't have cancer causing this. Right. And anybody can have uterine cancer, after, after, and usually it's after menopause. So you can make your own estrogen in the fat, or sometimes when you take estrogen, then the uterus is the only organ that you really have to worry about cancer with with taking estrogen not orally because it builds up a lining and the lining becomes abnormal. Okay, so Angelina Jolie has the BRCA gene. Yes. And preemptively had her breast removed. Right. So that there would never be a concern for her to have breast cancer. Mm-hmm. As a gynecologist, would is there a gene that you can identify, and would you recommend a preemptive removal of the uterus the, for women that, that are worried about that or have cancer histories in the family, or do you just look at a case-by-case-by-case situation? The American uh, Congress of OBGYN right. does not give a guideline for family history of uterine cancer okay. to take the uterus out. So okay. it's not an indication. Or BRCA, BRCA genes also are... Are, uh, show risk for uterine cancer, mm-hmm. breast cancer, and colon cancer. So okay. those three things, we don't take the colon out. Right. And we're not right. to, but the colon we need, and the uterus after childbearing is really the organ that we don't need. We need, we still need ovaries if they're still well. Right. So I would suggest just watching it, and, and bleeding okay. is, is the issue. If you were really afraid of that and you had, you had um, BRCA1 and 2, I would get an ultrasound of my uterus after menopause every year. Every year. And just look at the lining. We can tell with an ultrasound if it's too thick. So so don't rush to a surgery, but be aware that you have a risk potential and make sure that you and your physician monitor it consistently. Right. And your physician probably will suggest that. Right. So, uh, and I forgot to suggest ovarian cancer is in on the BRCA genes. Yeah. So it's very common for for us to... to respond when we hear that you're that a woman is bleeding after menopause by going, oh, we need to do some testing, and so that testing can be one of many things. It can be an ultrasound, which is what I always like to do before I did something invasive. If the lining is still really thin and you had some bleeding, there's nothing really to worry about except that it's messy. It's just it's a hassle. So when we have, um, so we do an ultrasound, say it's thick. Then I go to the next step, which is to biopsy the lining of the uterus. I don't, I don't perform those anymore, but I did all the time. So if the lining was thick, we'd, get a, we'd put a little curette into the uterus and take a biopsy, send it off. If it's normal, then there's, there's no treatment, except to do something to stop the bleeding so you're not bothered. But if there is something wrong, then we take the patient to a full DNC, And if that has cancer in it, then a hysterectomy. But it's the most treatable cancer. So a dilation and curatage, which means you dilate them. The cervix. And scrape all of the lining out. Right. Scrape or suction out the whole lining. So we use it. It looks like a 
a long handled, like an iced teaspoon with mm-hmm. e- with edges mm-hmm. that are sharp and kind of a hole in the spoon. Mm-hmm. But we use that to cure it all out. Okay. And then it usually it's it's a very uh, low risk procedure, mm-hmm. and it's you go to sleep just for a few minutes because it's very painful if you stayed awake. Yeah. So that's the only reason we would put people to sleep for that. Okay. And probably in 10 years, we won't. We'll find something find else. Another way to do it, yeah. But uh, in any case, that's what your doctor's thinking of. Now, now that we've ruled out cancer, now that right. we've decided, okay, here we have uterine bleeding, I deal with it now because I replace estrogen. Testosterone does not cause uterine bleeding, only estrogen. Okay. So when we give estrogen pellets, then anytime we get bleeding and we've ruled out cancer, We then have to figure out how to balance it, how to balance that estrogen so it doesn't make the uterus bleed. When you use, uh, I've heard you describe this before to to women, and you use a a lawnmower or grass cutting analogy that has to do with the thickness of the lining. Right. I forgot about that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Can can you talk to that? Yeah. So the lining in the uterus thickens and thickens and thickens until it gets so thick under the, under the effects of estrogen, mm-hmm. that then it can't be held by the uterus and it just bleeds. Mm-hmm. It just, it, it actually- tear off and fall. Yeah, they, they, so we, it cuts the grass. Yeah. It usually leaves some tissue in there mm-hmm. that then grows again if you don't do something about it. So- <laughs> Which is why a DNC is like having your your yard resodded to come yes. in and scrape everything That's down right. to dirt, and then right. they put new grass down. Right, but when we, the one hormone that balances estradiol mm-hmm. is progesterone. Not progestin, but progesterone. So we give natural progesterone with the estradiol so that the grass never grows. Okay. Okay, so if I do that from the very beginning, usually I won't have uterine bleeding. I'd like to get like that for my yard. Yeah. Just well, to, just, yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? But it wouldn't be green very long. No. But in this, in, in the world of postmenopausal hormones... Any type of estrogen, doesn't matter. In fact, pellets aren't even a, as common a, a cause of bleeding as other types of estrogen. But you have to take progesterone if you have estradiol being given to you so that the lawn stays the same height. You don't get cancer. You don't have bleeding. It's not a hassle. There used to be a theory by the men in the OBGYN field that everybody should continue to have periods if they took their estrogen just to punish us for taking estrogen. So they thought we should ha- take our estrogen and progesterone for 21 days and then bleed for seven until we were 90. And I, of course, had to stand up in that lecture where I was, at that time, one of the few women, and say, you're wrong. We don't want to bleed the rest of our lives. Yeah. That's not what we want. And there's another way. So that was their way of emptying the uterus out. Mm-hmm. And my way is just don't build it up. So if we do have someone who for some reason builds a lining, and I do an ultrasound before people come in to make sure I know there's nothing in there when I start the estrogen, and then we can, if we have bleeding down the line, redo it. I've learned so much from you (laughs) about the growth of medical knowledge and the evolutionary change of medical practice. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you talk about that was the standard of care. What you were taught in school is that women mm-hmm. just bleed, and you just keep them healthy by letting them bleed till they're ninety, uh, or till they die, or whatever, yeah. whatever the time frame. Or is. they get sick of it and, and they stop taking estrogen. And now the <laughs> sense of what doctors are taught and what they do, uh, that sounds so archaic and and out of line. And it does because now half of the gynecologists are women. Yeah, you think that's the reason? I think it is. I think it's okay. because we entered the field, and now there's a lot of us. I was one of the first. Female People, gynecologist, yeah. F- female gynecologist, but but because we entered the field, uh, we started saying, well, women, you guys have to talk to women and ask them this stuff. Because then, in those days, no one said to their doctor, I'm not going to do that. They just yeah. went out of the office and they said, yes, sir, n- yes, sir. And they they threw their prescription in the trash as they left. Yeah, I, I remember reading about George Washington was dying of pneumonia. And they kept using uh, leeches, and they kept bleeding him because that was the standard of care. Yeah. That uh, and they had young leeches. doctors there that were aware of a new procedure called a tracheotomy, but because they were young doctors and they were treating the father of our nation, they weren't allowed to touch him, so they couldn't do it. They could have they saved got died. Him. Yeah, absolutely. So the new ideas... Was there and was life-saving, but it wasn't accepted yet. And the reason they knew that 
may not have been that they were taught, but they knew that if there's an obstruction here, if you cut a hole here, right, or excuse me, an obstruction here, and you cut a hole here, then the patient will live because they know anatomy. Right. So a lot of the things that when a new treatment's given to me, I ha- I look at the physiology behind it, meaning the biology and how it works in your body with everything else right. chemically. So the, the law of unintended consequences. Right. I, I yeah. take that treatment and say, like a new diabetes drug, how does this work? Mm-hmm. And which hormones and which which hormones does yeah. this alter and how does it alter liver function and how does it alter pancreatic function? And then if that makes sense, right. then then I'm more apt to then try it try. with patients. Mm-hmm. And this is stuff that that has been proved by the FDA, but many people aren't using it like Victoza. Mm-hmm. So that's a diabetic Victoza medication. Victoza is a pre-diabetic medicine. And a that, diabetic medicine. And an actual medicine. diabetic mm-hmm. medicine. The, yeah. It's the only one that makes you lose weight. Yeah. And and that sometimes keeps you from being a diabetic. Right. Once, once you're on that for a while, you don't have to take it forever because if you lose enough weight, sometimes in type 2 diabetes, you don't have diabetes anymore. Mm-hmm. So back to uh, postmenopausal bleeding. So now you understand why people get so excited about it. And then patients get excited about it because they don't want it. Right. So our job is to somehow balance the progesterone with the estrogen. If they want to continue estrogen, they could stop taking estrogen and then just take testosterone in my office. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, they have that option. Or increase the progesterone dose or the way we give it because it can be given as a cream. It can be given as a... As a, we have one type of pill that actually bypasses the liver called a BLA progesterone. They could take it that way. There's is no that, other. Is that a sublingual or is that something you it's just a, swallow? It's oral. Yeah. One pharmacy that we know of makes it, and it works beautifully. We can use um, sublingual under the tongue or buckle, which is like a lozenge that you put in uh, in your uh, cheek or under your tongue before you go to bed at night. And that's the other thing. Progesterone makes you tired, and it helps you sleep. So you take so it at night. You take it at night. You yeah. don't take it in the morning. I've had lots of people come from other doctors and I'm so tired. Well, they're taking their progesterone in the morning. Yeah. So they're really chilled all day, but they don't get anything done. But taking it at night helps you sleep. So that's the idea. That's the hormone of choice. That's the hormone that pre- that also prevents uterine cancer. So what if somebody can't take this? I have some people who it makes them the, have the opposite. They bleed more. We don't know why. Yeah. We have no idea why that is. But sometimes it actually is something that gives them physical side effects throughout their body. So the answer is, is progesterone in a tiny amount that is put inside the uterus. And the way we do that is with an IUD. It's called Mirena. There's only one IUD with Mirena. And no, it's not for birth control when we use it this way. It is usually for birth control. Mm-hmm. But we use it in postmenopausal women who are taking estrogen so that right inside the uterus, the estrogen will come from the bloodstream, but there's a little progesterone there and it keeps the lining really thin. And it lasts five years. So it's a, it's huge. I mean, so it's a sort of a spot located filter that filters that out so that the, the uterus doesn't continue to grow, develop grow a lining. lining. Yeah. It's like, Putting the um, but it's, it's almost topical. I mean, yeah, the it's almost topical. It's yeah. right next to the, the right lining. Word. Yeah, that's exactly what it's like. Yeah, but you don't get it into the rest of your body. Mm-hmm. I have one patient that has really dry eyes. Progesterone makes dry eyes worse. Testosterone makes it better. So she gets an improvement with the testosterone, but she can't take the the progesterone, and she's got a uterus. Which is a good example of you're looking at the whole complex to say, right. if we shuffle this, how do, how do the dominoes fall over here? Right. And there are some symptoms that we have to change dosages so we avoid certain side effects. Right. And in this case, she did not want her dry eyes back. That right. was not something she wanted because they were severe. So we gave her a marina, and that was it. Mm-hmm. She was better. So that's another option. Some women don't want to do that. They don't want something inside of them. They're, you know, that's their choice. So my last option for managing this is I have a few patients. They have to sign a release. <laughs> but I will give them estrogen if they will get their ultrasound once a year and show me, I give them a low dose of estrogen, mm-hmm. but show me that their lining is thin. Mm -hmm. So once a year, I look at their uterus and make sure there's no excessive lining, therefore no cancer, and they won't bleed. 
So that they are people who have bad side effects from progesterone and just do not feel good on that hormone. Mm -hmm. So those are people that I'll, I'll make a conciliatory um, gesture because I know that they'll just stop taking hormones altogether and they'll feel even worse. So that's, there are ways to work around guidelines and that's one of them. If mm -hmm. the patient's willing to take a risk, but there's not much risk if you check the ultrasound once a year. Okay. So I'll, I will but, do that. And, and then typically will they bleed every month? They don't bleed at all. They don't bleed at all. Okay. And, and because they're not bleeding at all, that's why you want to do the ultrasound to see right. what the condition of the lining is. Right. And if they bleed in the middle of this, then okay. I'm going to do the ultrasound right then. Okay. Now, there's some other reasons people bleed. That's where I was going to go. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It no, no, no. That's take good. Take your thunder. Yeah. But I've noticed that some women have uterine bleeding even when they've got their progesterone, even when the lining's thin. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of women are vitamin K deficient. Vitamin K is the vitamin that helps you clot your blood. Vitamin K is in green leafy vegetables. Not all of us eat kale every day. You can say K for kale. Uh-huh, right. Yeah. So basically, we I noticed it in surgery. That's how I really got onto this. I started doing K levels too, vitamin K levels. Because in surgery, I'd operate and I would have this beautiful, meaning we have the whole abdomen open and we can see the whole pelvis and it was dry, no bleeding. And then... It, Right before we close, everything would ooze. They used up their vitamin K. Wow. So I started treating people ahead of time with oral vitamin K mm -hmm. for three days before and then during the post-op period for a week. I had the driest cases there were in wow. the GYN department. I, I didn't lose hardly any blood because that's just kind of a common thing that women have. And I think it's much more common in women than men. I'm not sure why. But I oftentimes will have somebody who has a thin lining and is still bleeding, give them vitamin K, done bleeding. They just keep taking it. Hmm. It's 100 micrograms. You can get it at the health food store. Okay. The only people that can't Don't take it. Don't need a prescription. It, nope. The only people that can't take it are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, people who, have, who are on warfarin or blood thinners. Yeah. You can't take it if you're on that. Right. It, it can reverse it. So that's another thing that can cause bleeding. Blood yeah. thinners. Right. Because they're stopping you from having a blood clot, or if you have an arrhythmia in your heart, they're keeping you from getting a blood clot to your brain, and that's good. Now, you were telling me before, <laughs> but, before we started the podcast, we were talking about this, mm -hmm. blood thinners and fish oil? And fish oil. Fish oil actually makes your bleeding time, like if you cut yourself, the time it takes for you to stop bleeding, uh -huh. very short. Excuse me, very long. So before you have surgery and... A lot of people who take a ton of fish oil right. for their cholesterol and their lipids, they bleed a lot. So if you know that, as a physician, you want to remember to ask that. Or right. Tell them 10 days before your surgery, a week before your surgery, stop Ten taking days. it. 10 days yeah. before the surgery, you have to stop vitamin E, fish oil, all the oil vitamins. Yeah. And, um, and, take, and it would be helpful to take vitamin K if you don't have a clotting problem. So those are ways we look into nutrition to keep somebody from bleeding. Mm -hmm. Now then, there are also fibroids. Uter uteruses have fibroids, and when we go through menopause and we don't feed them with estrogen, they get really small. But then when we give people estrogen back, sometimes they get big again. again. And fibroids are, are benign. They're not cancer. Mm -hmm. They're muscle tumors. They look like swirls, but they don't have the same receptor sites for progesterone in them. So sometimes I can give someone progesterone with their estrogen, and they continue to bleed because there's this one area in the uterus that just doesn't, doesn't respond. Absorb the progesterone. Right. Yeah. So those people, uh, that's a little more difficult. That's like surgery versus taking estrogen. Oftentimes, we just treat them with testosterone and don't have an issue. Okay. And don't give them the estrogen at right. all. But if they are getting both, then you have to monitor these things. Yes. And if the problems aren't, it, it's like doing triage in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. if, if the problem isn't solved by A, intervention, B, intervention, then you go to C, intervention. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And the C intervention in this is when you have fibroids in the uterus that are growing that and not responding is hysterectomy, take the uterus out, or no more estrogen. Okay. And that's about the only point I get to when I say no more estrogen, because estrogen's very important to 
many of the things that we need as we get older. So it take so I try really hard to get rid of the dysfunctional bleeding. But right. So so to wrap this up, uh, testosterone is the primary hormone that you regulate and intervene with, mm-hmm. but you also do a lot with estrogen. Mm-hmm. And women that still have a uterus who get estrogen are then going to have issues with bleeding. Mm-hmm. And the panic point of that is that is a recognized outcome of getting estrogen, but it also is the the first signal that they might have uterine cancer. Right. So and I don't want everyone who bleeds thinking they have uterine cancer. No, 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 not at all. But that, that is, that like is a, the alarm that goes off that, de- that doctors rule out. And it usually yeah. takes a lifetime of too much estrogen. Mm-hmm to have uterine cancer, but still, we still hear that. That's our trigger. Right. There's certain triggers that you immediately do testing and, for. And so you do check, and they don't mm-hmm. have es- uh, uterine cancer, but they do have bleeding. So then you have interventions to reduce or stop the bleeding. Right. And I've only had two people with uterine cancer over the last, in, in biobalance, in the hormone practice, over the last 10 years. So that's, it's not common. I've seen it in my other practice where people came in, either they made too much estrogen or they had genetic issues right. and they'd had breast cancer and, or they were on tamoxifen. That increases your risk of uterine cancer too. So I've seen it a, a bunch, but I haven't seen it in, in my, just my practice with, with biobalance that much. But I, we see unusual bleeding all the time because that's just the, that's our biggest complaint and side yeah. effect okay. so but it's not one that should be scared you should be scared of if you're a no female. no and that's the point you want to make and, and actually that point is developed if you do if you allow a segue want to do a bit of mm-hmm. shameless self-promotion here for the last two years kathy and i've been writing a book and the book is uh, actually if you're a regular watcher of our podcast you'll see that we've changed our our table decoration. Uh, These are two copies of our book that are being published and will be available March the 3rd of this year. Uh, You can go to thesecretfemalehormone.com to order this book. Uh, The red cover is the cover for the American edition, and the uh, white cover is the cover for the European edition. But it's being published uh, in India, in South Africa, in Australia, uh, in Canada, uh, the United States, and the United Kingdom. So, and, and that's coming out. We're very excited about it. And as we get closer to the publication date, we'll actually do a podcast on the book itself. But there is more substantive and detailed information about this topic in the book, along with all the other topics well, every that, topic we talk that we about. talk about on our podcast. Mm-hmm. So hopefully you'll be conscious of this and you'll go to thesecretfemalehormone.com and order yourself a copy. Thank you very much Thank for you. listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.